guys, it's Dave. I'm going to talk today about the book of Hebrews. Uh, it's been fascinating to me lately, and so I wanted to, to talk about it because it's coming together for me in my mind as a big picture as far as it's like a sermon, really. The way that the topics that are covered in the book of Hebrews, I used to always view them as individual subjects because it was hard for me to see how they all connected. And I could find little pieces here and there that were interesting in and of themselves. But as far as stepping back and seeing what the author is saying uh, in, in whole, is uh, it's really been an eye-opener for me. So I was going to share some of my insights with you to see if uh, perhaps you would benefit as well. Um, Hebrews and the book of Revelation, I feel, are both um, books that deal with the finish line. Uh, and I think that might be part of the problem with us getting our brains around them. Because if you're like me, you've spent decades even trying to find the starting line, really. I mean, it's one thing to become a Christian, but when you finally start to get your brain around what it is that, that being a Christian is supposed to be, that it, it's, it, it's, it's an eye-opener. And it's like, why didn't someone tell me this decades ago, you know? Uh, but the Hebrews and Revelation talk about the, the finish line. And so ma being maturity, the end of the process, what is it that's, that God is after in all of this? What is the end goal? Um, and so Hebrews and Revelation both talk about internal end goal and then the external end goal in the kingdom of God. So let's talk for a minute about an overview. If I were to summarize the book of Hebrews as far as the way I understand it now, I would say that it's a book of warning, that the... Um, the author of the of the book of Hebrews is telling the Hebrew Christians, look, you guys have made a great start, but you're slacking. And I want to remind you of what's at stake. And I want to remind you that you could lose it all. I think that's part of the reason why Hebrews isn't preached as much, or if at all. I can't remember the last time I heard someone preach out of the book of Hebrews, because it flies in the face of the idea of eternal security, that once you're, you know, nothing can separate us. They use that from uh, Romans. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Therefore, once you become a Christian, then there's nothing you can do to lose it. The book of Hebrews over and over again uh, talks about the risks involved in, in giving up, in, um, in stopping. If I were to pull themes out of the book of Hebrews, one of the recurring, in fact, probably the most prominent theme of the book of Hebrews is the word if. It's a conditional word. It's used over and over again. I'm going to review some of the verses in Hebrews that have the word if that make it very clear that it's conditional. There's, this is not a guarantee. It's not a shoe in uh, the rest of God, uh, becoming brothers of Christ, become, getting the clear conscience and getting your sin removed, all of these goals that are set forth in the book of Hebrews are all conditional and great big ifs. What, it's, a, it's a big little word, isn't it? It's like If you hold fast your confidence to, for, to steadfast to the end, it says. Endurance is another theme of the book of Hebrews, uh, as is warning, as is um, today. Today is a huge theme in Hebrews right now. The issue is right now, what's going on right now. We're not in the past and not in the future. Once we get pointed in one or the other or both of those directions, we miss what God is doing right now and we're at risk. The risks are there. And so no wonder that the book gets dismissed, or not not dismissed, just just tactfully avoided because it doesn't fit with the modern gospel that says once you start, once you start, you will finish. Uh, the book of Hebrews paints a different picture. It says that the walk of toward Christ, toward perfection and maturity, toward completion, toward uh, becoming a brother of of Christ and a son of God is a tightrope. Once you start walking on that tightrope, you can't get part way across and decide to give up. Once you get, once you start walking, there's only two ways off of that tightrope, man. And one of them ends in your death. And the other, you have to watch every step, guard your steps, every step you take until you reach the end of that thing. And then the promise and the glory are yours. What God, what God lays out in his word are yours. If you endure to the end. Enduring to the end and a big if, that's a recurring theme in the book of Hebrews. So I wanted to uh, take a moment and lay out a couple of the, the complete list I come up with of the goals that are laid out, the end game from the book of Hebrews that the author lays out. I keep calling him the author. I know he, it's attributed to Paul the Apostle as the, the gospel of, of the Hebrew, I mean the, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. I don't think that Paul wrote it. There's some back and forth debate on that. All of his his uh, epistles follow the same pattern except Hebrews. 
He doesn't open with a greeting from Paul. He doesn't close it with the salutation as is my, in all of, and all my letters, he says at one place. There's the only, there's a couple places. One where he says, you remembered me in my chains. That's a phrase that Paul used a lot. And, uh, the other when he says, our brother Timothy in the final chapter. And so, uh, those are two things that make it seem to me that it's an associate of Paul's. Obviously, it's something that might have been Barnabas. It might have been somebody who was super familiar with the scriptures like Paul. But the phrasing and the way that the, the things is structured just doesn't, it doesn't strike me as Paul at all. But it doesn't really much matter. What, it doesn't matter if, if Paul wrote it or not. I, what matters is what's being said and do we believe what's being said? Belief is another theme of Hebrews. Here are some of the goals that I wrote down that uh, following from the from first to, to the thirteenth chapter of Hebrews, brothership of Jesus. That's in the first and the second chapter. Uh, Co heirs with him over all of God, the works of God's hands. That's in chapter two. Uh, the rest of God. That's chapter four. Uh, the promise. Now the promise he uses in association with Abraham, but the promise he leaves open ended as though God has given each of us a promise and we need to endure like Abraham did and believe and endure. That's, that's, those are two different things. Uh, Abraham believed God and then he waited patiently for the fulfillment of the promise. One of the promises of, of the son Isaac he got. The other that he didn't get the, to enter into the land. He wandered in the land of promise as though he was a stranger. He didn't inherit a square foot of it that he could live in and claim as his own in his lifetime. That's yet to come. He wandered as as pilgrims in the wilderness, and he had his eyes set on a city whose foundation is God, and that's in chapter 11. Uh, so it says that all of the people in, in the Faith Hall of Fame were given promises that they, they, were, they have yet to receive because God is waiting for them so that we can be in on that. He didn't want them to fulfill their promise without us being along for the ride. So if we endure to the end, we can join them is what he's saying in fulfilling that. So we believe God. It plays out in how we live our lives. And then at the end of that, if we endure to the end, we receive the promise and not before then. And not if we don't endure. You jump ship, it's permanent, it says in Hebrews 6 and other places. If you sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sin. You're done. Remember Esau. We, he blew it irreversibly one time. He sold his birthright for a, a, for the stew. And it said he, he sought it, it with weeping, repentance, trying to undo it. And it was not undoable. It wasn't undoable. Esau blew it. And he uses examples like Esau and the children of the, of Israel in the wilderness to remind us that they received a promise and they made a good start and then they blew it. They weren't careful. They didn't endure to the end. They I don't know what they thought. They thought that uh, it wouldn't be the way it is. They didn't want to be, wait patiently for God to fulfill his word. And so they were done. And he's using that as a warning. God's law written on our hearts and on our minds. That's another goal of the book of Hebrews. It's huge. A clear conscience. I don't think anyone preaches on that. I would love to hear a good sermon on that. I may uh, try to do one myself. The importance of a clear conscience. The Apostle Paul was big on that. And so is the author of Hebrews. So maybe it was Paul. Yeah. Getting The idea is that your sins aren't just forgiven. You can you you commit a sin that you're ashamed of. You confess it. It's forgiven. You still have that gnawing at you, at your conscience. Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful. You can't tell you how grateful I am to have that forgiven. But boy, I wish I hadn't blown it in the first place. I wish I hadn't disobeyed God. I wish I hadn't sinned because it's still in you. See? And he says that the old covenant needed to be retired because the old covenant just brought forgiveness. It didn't bring removal of that sin. And the end of that is a clear conscience because you don't have to worry about and agonize in the deep part of your heart over the sin that you committed if you don't commit a sin. If you obey God, what is a sin? A sin is an act of disobedience against something that God wants you to do as presented either in his word or directly from his, from his lips. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus said that. If a word has proceeded out of the mouth of God into your ears and he told you something to do and you decided, yeah, no, I'm not, and you disobeyed, that's a sin. It's an act of disobedience. So if every time God presents you with something to do, you say, of course, and you do it, there's no sin. There's no violation of anything that God told you to do. And that's the goal. That's the end goal of the new covenant, the, the better covenant founded on better promises. You're not a sinner who's forgiven as under the old covenant. You are cleansed, 
Clean, cleanliness is another goal. You're clean. Clean. Not just externally, but internally. The old covenant dealt with the external. Uh, the new covenant deals with the internal. And that's why it's superior. Because it gets that thing in you that rebels and disobeys out. And you're recreated in his image. So now he can come and live in you. And you can live in the land. The rest of God. Remember I said that? It was one of the, the, one of the, the goals that was offered off here. That's what that is. To rest in God. His works were finished. Uh, the, those that came out of Israel couldn't enter into it because of dis unbelief. Unbelief and disobedience. They rebelled against God. Rebellion is an interesting topic. I mean, our country was founded in rebellion. Rebellion's a big thing. Anyone who's watched Star Wars knows that the rebellion are the good guys, right? Yeah, I'm going to push back against those who are telling me what to do. Well, God's telling us what to do, and we push back. Because we're made in his image and we're put into an environment that's separated from him, we have no choice, really. It's just human nature to push back. We have a will. And we want to express it. That's part of our image. That's part of the image of God, to have a will and want to express it and exert it. And so how do you bring that thing under control and, and rewrite it so that you... Your will is aligned with God's will, so that everything you do is in obedience. You you just you jump to obey Him. Anything He tells you to do, whatever I can do to please you, pleasing God is another huge thing in Hebrews. Please Him. Um, the removal of sins, uh, a heavenly country slash city slash kingdom. Where all the guys in Hebrews eleven are looking forward to something, a homeland, a, a city, a country, uh, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven to the new earth. That's what they're looking for. It's a promise that God has given to those who believe him and who endure to the end. If you don't endure to the end, what happens to you? I'll leave that in God's hands. All I'm trying to cover is what the book of Hebrews is saying. Maturity, completion, full-grown, blameless. Is it possible to be blameless? We talked about that in another video. That's offered up as, a, as the goal in the book of Hebrews. Sonship will be a son of God. Those he, he, those, those he receives as son, he rebukes. If you endure that chastening, then you're a son. If you're not chastened, then you're an illegitimate. You're not a son. So enduring, you see the theme here, right? If we endure to the end, we will be saved. If, if, if. Let me show you a couple of those if verses in Hebrews. And these are real eye-openers when taken as a group. Hebrews 2 has a couple, back to back, Hebrews 2, 2 and 2, 3 have a couple of ifs, one in each verse, and this is interesting. If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and, and transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The book of Hebrews opens saying that God used to talk to Israel through the prophets. He would send message through the angels, which means messenger, angel, through to the prophets, and then that message would get on to Israel for them to accept or reject as they saw fit. <laughs> He's saying that now he speaks to us through his son, Jesus. And then it goes into his Jesus' qualifications. God has made him higher than every man and every angel, everything, and put everything under his feet. And then he says, why? I think in verse 8, because he quotes Psalm 45, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, God says to Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Put, put him over the works of all of God's hands. He loved righteousness means he embraced it. It didn't mean like he pined over it like love. There's no emotion involved. You loved it. You embraced it. You pursued it. Righteousness, obedience. God's will was preeminent to, to Jesus. And it was proven that he came and died and rose again. That whole thing, that, that whole process that needed to happen proved to the Father that Jesus loved him and would do his will even if it cost him everything. And it did. And raised him up and put him above everything as a result. Loved righteousness and hated iniquity, lawlessness, disobedience. He hated it, shunned it, he rejected it. Didn't despise it, and he wasn't chewing on it. He was saying, no, 
This was the key issue of Jesus and the key reason why God anointed him and put him over all of the works of his hands. He's saying that's why he's he's it's more qualified to speak to us. His word is more sure than that of even the prophets. Jesus supersedes that, so we should listen to him. In chapter 2, he says, Therefore, we should pay the more earnest heed to him, lest we drift away. And again, this is why Hebrews isn't preached. That chapter two, verse one is probably why uh, where the kid gets his finger caught in the machinery as far as the current preaching, because that flies in the face of eternal security. It says we should listen to him very carefully, more earnestly, he says, lest we drift away. And he said he gave us this word and it was confirmed by those who heard it from him directly, the apostles. And he says, and God even confirmed it with signs and wonders and miracles and, and solidified it. And, and so we need to listen to this because God is putting mankind over the works of all of his hands, he said, they say. All of them. There will be men who will rule everything that God has created with Christ, co-rule with him. He says, we don't see all the works, all the works of God under man's feet, but we do see Jesus. He was the forerunner. He's our great high priest. He was faithful. That's chapter three. He was faithful as a son in God's house. Whose house are we? This is a good if. Mm, you're going to love this. Moses was a faithful uh, servant in God's house. Jesus was a faithful son in God's house. Whose house are we? We are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. There it is again. It's a big if. The choice is ours. If we endure to the end. If we hold fast our confidence to the end, then we are the house that Jesus is the faithful son over. He's our brother, it says. We are brothers of his. You know, that's not just a figure of speech. We become brothers of his. Like legitimate. He is our older brother because he cut the path for us. He was obedient unto death. If we are obedient unto death, then we will join him in that. And, and only if. If, we're, if we can continue to rebel, then we will be destroyed and we will not enter into that. That's the book of Hebrews. Remember those wandered in the desert. Today, if you hear his voice. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. Their carcasses dropped in the wilderness because they rebelled against God. They didn't believe him. If there's a theme and a, and a punchline for Hebrews, it's believe God, believe his promise, let it affect your daily life all the way until your life ends, even if it costs you everything. If, it's if, it's a tightrope. You got it. You got this. He's saying one step at a time. You can, you can do that tightrope one step at a time. You try to think about the whole thing, then forget it. You'll probably panic and jump overboard, but you can, you can do this. We've got a great high priest who will help us. That's what it says uh, in verse in, in chapter seven. It talks about Melchizedek, but chapter four he says he's our high, great high priest. And in chapter five it talks about the Levitical priesthood on earth and the inferiority of it and why it was a problem because the priests that helped in the tabernacle on earth were mortal like us and subject to sin, so they would have to offer for themselves as well as for the people. And uh, Jesus is made after a different order. That's the Aaronic, if you will, the Levitical priesthood on earth. Jesus was made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's what it talks about in chapter 7. Chapter 6, between 5 and 7, the, uh, talking about the earthly uh, ministry and, the, and Melchizedek, is chapter 6 where he says, you guys should know all this already, but you guys are slacking, man. You guys have to tighten it up. That's where he talks about if you're sinning willfully, you're, there's no more sacrifice for sin, but you set yourself up as an as a enemy and as an adversary of God. God's not going to keep rebellious children around. If you want to choose to rebel against him, you're going to reap it, and I'm going to reap it, all of us. But if you can hold fast and be faithful unto the end like our great older brother is, then we will receive the same rewards that he did. Is that what it says or not? If you think that it says something different, by all means, please let me know. Because I don't want to misrepresent or misunderstand this. Let me know what I'm missing here. Chapter 6 is a warning. Grow up. That's where he talks about Abraham. Abraham received the promise and waited patiently for it. We need to do the same. Use Abraham as our example here is what he's saying. That's the first example he is using. Chapter 7, he talks about Melchizedek. The writer of Hebrews gets a lot of information about Melchizedek out of like four verses in Genesis or however much. It's very little. He must have had a second source or else God just opened it up in a way that uh, that he knew was true. What, it doesn't say Melchizedek was never born and never die. I don't know where he got all that from. Endless life. 
the power of an endless life? You're not going to find that in Genesis, the Genesis account. It must have been from another source. I'm not saying he's not reliable. I'm just saying it's interesting. He does not the same thing in when talking about the tabernacle. He attributes the, the golden censer to the ho most holy place rather than the holy place itself with the table and the, the lampstand. Um, I'm wondering why he, he did that too, because is that an error or not? So, yeah, Melchizedek, chapter 7, new priesthood, new law, new covenant, new. It all needed to be made new. New and better and superior, again, because it removes sin rather than just forgives it. Chapter 8 talks about the heavenly temple where Jesus ministers. See, that's the, the, the priests on earth and the Levitical deal down here with the external. Jesus became the high priest for us so he can help us. Come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain help in time of need. Uh, he, he ministers out of the heavenly version of that, which he purified with his own blood. But is, is 8 where it talks about purifying with blood? No, that's in 10. So the earthly temple and the heavenly temple is what he talks about in chapters 8 and 9. Uh, that chapter 9, both temples needed to be purified with blood. I've wondered why that is, and we'll have to talk about that in another video, but there's something about requiring blood, sprinkling, the sprinkling of blood that cleanses. And uh, I think we'll talk about that in another video. Uh, but chapter 10 talks about the maturity, talks another, another way about the, uh, the final product, uh, the end game, maturity. Uh, the clean conscience. It's really important to the writer of the book of Hebrews. Your conscience is clean. We talked about that. Because you're not sinning anymore. It's possible to get to that point where you obey God all the time. Do you have to disobey? I'm reminded of that person I heard recently who said, Oh yeah, I sin. I still sin. We all sin. Really? We have to? We have to. You have to disobey God. Give me an example of something that you have to, you just have no choice but to disobey God on. If he told you to do something and gave you the power to, to accomplish it, uh, then why would you not? You think it's okay to not. It just boggles my mind. So, yeah, we'll be mature brothers like Christ if we can hold fast through the same process that he endured. Do you know what said he was perfected? The captain of their salvation, perf make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus was brought to completion. That seems to imply that he was incomplete when he got here, that he had to become a man that could die so that he could obey unto death. Because if he can't die as he did before, then you can't be tested to that final, that, that final level that God was looking for. And he brought him to it. In the garden, Jesus said, if there's any way possible, Father, all things are possible to you. If there's any way you could take this cup from me, please take it from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. God's will was more important to him than living. That's what it also says when it talks in, uh, I don't remember which chapter, I'm sorry, I didn't make a note where he said that he's comparing the old covenant to the new, and he said that uh, sacrifices and offerings didn't please you, but a body you prepared for me, Jesus says. You prepared a body for me to come into this world. He said, I have come to do your will, O God. He, he, he chucks out the old to establish the new. The new covenant is based on doing God's will. That's at its foundation. And that's what the end game is. When you write the law on your heart and on your mind, that's so that you can by nature obey him. That's the whole, that's the finish line. No wonder people don't talk about it. Why would you want to talk about that? That's not lift up your hand and then now you'll go to heaven when you die. Therefore, you can continue doing whatever you want and God will just bless it now instead of be angry about it. You can still sin if you need to. I've already forgiven it, he says. So that sounds like a great, a much greater message than lay your entire self on the altar to die your will, set aside your life and do what God wants you to do and let that process change you into the, into the brother of Christ and the son of God that he wants you to be. It's not it's snap your fingers and that doesn't just happen. That's a process that we need to endure and it was a process that Jesus endured. It's made perfect through suffering. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Wow. Jesus had to learn obedience. He had to be bound in one of our bodies to do it. And now he's our great high priest and he can relate to us and he can help us through that whole process. The, the power and the strength and the wisdom and the light are there, the writer of Hebrews says. The grace is there to help you to endure to the end. Enduring to the end, you have to. You get off the bus, then you're done. Almost makes me wish someone would have told us that but when we first started, right? Because <laughs> that's daunting. 
And it's a, it's quite a thing to spring onto someone who's halfway across the tightrope. Uh, then chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame. We all know it. The irony of that being that it's this is these are all a whole list of people who, through faith, obeyed God and how it turned out. And they obeyed God and, and, and finished that process, still not receiving the ultimate promise that God made because God is waiting for us, like I said, to join them. So that they, because they without us cannot be made perfect, complete, teleos. They can't be made, brought to the finish line without us. Isn't that something? What if God had let them go to the finish line without us? And then we were like group two or whatever. No, this is the church of the firstborn. It's the assembly of God. This is, this is his body. It's his city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem. It will represent him throughout the rest of the world. It's a remarkable promise. Remarkable. And it'll be ours if we can endure to the end and hold the faithful. Uh, chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. Chapter 12. Uh, 11 says, look at all these great patriarchs that we're all familiar with. Do what they did. Chapter 12 starts by saying, because we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us... Oh, boy. Let us use... Follow... I'm going to skip over that. Jesus... Jesus is our ultimate example of that also. Follow all the guys in chapter 11, but also follow Jesus. He followed the same exact pattern. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and then was given the highest place, and given a name above all names. Um, God chastens every son. That's the final exhortation. Jesus had to endure this, and now he's the son. I am your God. How does it go? Today I have begotten thee. Today I am your father and you have become my son. There was a moment where Jesus became God's son. I think that it was at the end of this process where he learned obedience and was crowned with glory and put over all the works of God's hands. And he's saying that all of God's sons will need to endure that. And it makes sense. And it's a wonderfully, I mean, the wisdom in that plan is just staggering to me. Chapter 13 is just a bunch of housekeeping, how to live day to day. Um, treat people right, don't commit fornication, you know, keep yourself separate from the world, obey the authorities over you, both in the church and in the city, uh, mind your business, treat people right. Um, yeah, so Hebrews, it's a remarkable book. And the more I read it, the more it gets into me, the more staggering it is to me. And I love it. It's a great book. But I hope that opens some ideas for you about the whole big picture of Hebrews. You made a great start cinch up and, and see this thing through to the end. Otherwise, you lose it all. It's an all or nothing thing. And when I say all, I mean all. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. Uh, the risks are huge. I don't want to, I would not want to chance that and say, well, maybe I can jump off the tightrope and I'll survive and God will make me a son anyways with those who endured to the end. You're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with those who made it, who, who to the very ed edge of their being, they were, they were brought to the very snapping point and they gave everything you're going to stand with them if you gave up and think that God's going to just forgive you and put you with them anyways? Nah, nonsense. You think you're going to be put over the works of God's hands if you if you break? Nah, no. Nah. So that's the warning from the book of Hebrews. Get, there's a lot at stake, and the rewards are staggering, and it's all or nothing. So let's do it. All right, I'm going to leave that there for now. If you have any thoughts on that, please leave them in the comments, and I will address them accordingly. Again, I'm not trying to steamroll you with this. Uh, if you feel I'm off on something, please point it out and I would love to discuss it. Again, I've been going over the book of Hebrews endlessly because it's just so amazing to me. It's almost overwhelming, really. Um, all right. If you have any thoughts, leave them in the comments. I will see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.